Hopefully that's better. I think so, huh? So mm -hmm. far. Okay, good. good. Okay, so the funny story. Um, <laughs> I can honestly say when I did that sermon, I didn't think about it. I would do it differently. I'd have a dash cam or something. But um, <laughs> when I watched it, I thought, oh no, I'm going to make people motion sick. <laughs> <laughs> And literally, I talked to someone this week that got sick to their stomach to my sermon. Oh, no. <laughs> I never had thought I would make someone sick. But my sermon made somebody sick. <laughs> More like car motion, huh? <laughs> yeah. And I thought about that. It's, in fact, Katie, got, who was taping it, got a little queasy. So <laughs> anyway, that was funny. So now I find it. We should have had a healing service. <laughs> well, hopefully this will be the last time I make someone sick to their stomach from my sermon, but I, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Okay, so here we are. Good to see you all. Uh, let's say a prayer, and we'll, uh, we'll jump into Numbers 18 here. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. With you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, let this time be fruitful let it be helpful. Continue to uphold us with your spirit in this uh, time of isolation and yet being connected in so many other ways. Um, give us patience and peace, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So we're going to try one more time to get this up and going on my Facebook. Maybe coming inside is the key. Next. Did he ever? All right. Did and you then, ever finish talking about a drive-in service? Oh, I don't think so. That's right. I started to lock up. So, um, oh, good. It's going to work now. Oh, good. Uh, let's see. Let me, I don't, I don't want that. Sorry, guys. We're going to say... Here is our Bible study, and we're going to go numbers, and we're going to not worry about tags, and we're going to go live. There we go. All right. I guess going outside is just too tempting. Um, so as far as uh, I'm going to share my my logo screen with you. Well, actually, I decided I wanted to go at it this way, didn't I? Yep. And uh, and then I'll get to my. There we go. Can you guys see my? Um, can you see my? Um, it runs into the sidebar. Yeah, so I'm going to fix that right now, I think. Let's see if I can. There, okay. All right, let me just get this over here like that. There you go. Get this. Is that helpful? No. It's yes. No. There, now you're there perfect. Got it now. Oh, okay. Yep, that's okay. Yeah. That's All good. right. All right. Excellent. We're still learning, obviously. <laughs> All right. So, so um, I'm going to put, so if, yeah, so if you've got everybody on the right side or something, then you can, you can see it that way. Okay, so as far as the online, the parking lot service, we're going to do something at 11 o'clock a week from the Sunday. Uh, people can come. We will have the speakers throughout the parking lot. We might have an FM transmitter so you can use your radio. We're still working on that. And um, we'll do a whole service um, with music outside and depending on the weather, of course, and how that works. But um, We'll be down by the gathering place, so however many people want to show up and do that, 
um, we can do that. So um, yeah, I'm excited about that. Justin's all ready to go and and we're kind of getting down the the online service. So, you know, hopefully that'll, we can do both of those for a few weeks until we can get back together. And then of course, we're looking at, um, we're looking at, let's see, why is, there we go. We're looking at, you know, what we do when we come back together um, as far as, um, as far as, you know, if we can have 50 people, we've figured out how many people we can get in the church and be six feet apart. And <laughs> so we are, we are having lots of fun, creative. I can't say it's fun. That's being facetious, but we're, we're figuring it out. All right. Why don't we have some Bible study, huh? All right. Very cool. Let's do it. And I can still see, I can, You'll have to just interrupt me. I can't see everybody right now. Let's see if I can make this just a little bigger. That helps. Okay, that's good. All right, perfect. Um, and then let me do this. Video. All right, there you go. So now you should really just see me and the text, hopefully. But regardless, let's roll. So chapter 18 the duties of priests and Levites. You are so excited to figure out the duties of the priests and the Levites. I just know it. I, you woke up this morning saying, I can't wait to hear about all these rules and regulations for the priests. Well, there just might be something helpful for us, but maybe we'll cruise through this pretty quickly. We'll see. So the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary, and you and your sons with all with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. And with you bring your brothers also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons um, with you are before the tent of testimony. They shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent, but shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or the altar, lest they and you die. Whoa. They shall join you and keep guard over the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent, and no outsider shall come near you. And you shall keep guard over the sanctuary and over the altar. And behold, I have taken your brothers and Levites from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you given to the Lord to do the service of the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil, and you shall serve. Sorry, now I have to shut my window because the garbage truck's coming. <laughs> oh, isn't this lovely? All right. Um, all right. And, and you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil, and you shall serve. I give you a priesthood as a gift, and any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. We're just going to keep going. We're going to get this whole thing on the table here. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, Behold, I have given you charge of the contributions made to me all the consecrated things of the people of Israel. I have given them to you as a portion and to your sons as a perpetual due. This shall be yours of the most holy things, reserved from the fire, every offering of theirs, every grain offering of theirs, and every sin offering of theirs, and every guilt offering of theirs, which they render to me, shall be most holy to you and your sons. In a most holy place, you shall eat it. Every male may eat it. It is holy to you. This also is yours, the contribution of their gift, all the wave offerings of the people of Israel. I have given them to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. All the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and all the grain and the fruits of what they give to the Lord, I give to you. Wow, priests are scoring here. 
the pre the first ripe fruits of all that is in the land which they bring to the lord shall be yours everyone who is clean in your house may eat it every devoted thing in israel shall be yours everything that opens the womb of the flesh whether man or beast which they offer to the lord shall be yours nevertheless the firstborn of man you shall redeem and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem in other words the people get to keep those but they do this redemption um, type deal. And their redemption price at the month old, you shall redeem them. You shall fix at five shekels in silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. Are you guys still out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, hang in there. There's actually some interesting stuff here. But I, like I say, let's just get the whole thing on board. But the firstborn of a cow or the firstborn of a sheep or the firstborn of the goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and shall burn their fat as a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So those go right to the Lord. But their flesh shall be yours as the beat breast that is waved and as the right thigh are yours. All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. Note that phrase, perpetual due. We, we've seen that come up already a couple times. It is a covenant of salt forever. So what does salt do? Salt purifies, preserves for the Lord, for you and for your offspring with you. And the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land. So if you think the priests are really scoring here, wait a minute, they don't get any land. And of course, they're not in the land yet, but so this is looking ahead. Neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. Okay, wow. Well, let's see. Um, let's let's, let's uh, pause. We can pause there. Um, what what's going on here what what's your reaction to some of this at this point god Anybody? told us to aaron but i wonder if the people knew that all their contributions were going to be used by aaron and his family well yeah this is all to god's people here so i'm assuming that this this would be very much uh, that they would know that, you know, the priests are being provided for in this way. That's, yeah. Well, it started by saying that, that uh, the Lord said to Aaron, not to all the people. No, but that's kind of like a command or giving an order. That yeah. But, you know, Bert, I'm glad you mentioned that because actually note, that this is one of the few times God speaks to Aaron directly. Yeah. He always speaks directly to Moses, but here God speaks to Aaron. And that is interesting. That doesn't happen very often. Um, so he's given, it's almost like God is saying to Aaron, this is how you're going to be provided for. You don't need to, you're not going to have land. Your family's not going to have land. You're going to take care of my sanctuary. And that's your family's allotment. And you're going to be, you know, so, so yeah, but I'm assuming that the people would, uh, <laughs> would have this information passed on to them. That's, yeah, that's great. But it, it's kind of like, it, it's not a part-time job to be at the sanctuary or, and then go home and work with your sheep and cattle and raising grain. Their whole, uh, assignment is to stay there. And, uh, so I don't, I kind of see it that this would be like, you know, a law that's passed somewhere in our government, and we hear all about it, doesn't just apply to the people who who first heard it, I think. Yeah, great, great. And they did write it down in scripture at some point. I mean, it's oral tradition probably now, but still, the details would have been, uh, somebody was taking notes. <laughs> well, absolutely, and do they have five shekels of silver while they're wandering the wilderness? Probably not. This is pointing, so I, I appreciate your comments there. This is, again, regulations and laws that are actually pointing forward to when they enter the promised land. Um, so this is really, 
I'm telling Aaron this right now, but this is really for the people when they get into the Holy Land, when they get into the promised land that they've been, been waiting for, which this generation, you know, what, what we start to see happening now in Numbers, which is interesting, is a transition. We got the old generation, they're not going to get to go into the promised land, and now we got the new generation on the scene. And so we've got this kind of bridge um, that's starting to happen here in the book of Numbers. So, yeah, good. Those are great comments. Other, other comments, things that jump. Oh, Cindy, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, what is, what is the difference? In verse 9, there's grain, sin, and guilt offerings. Yes. Can you clarify that, what, what those are? You know, we've, we've got a great expert in Kim Grasmick out there who I think can help us with this. But yes, I can. But Kim, you want to take a go at it, but yeah, well, not to put you on a, the spot. No, that's okay. Um, there's actually, I can send it to you, Cindy, but there, there's a chart that kind of lays out these different offerings for different purposes. So you have friendship offerings, you have guilt offerings, you have... Um, you know, any number of these things, and it's just a definition, it's just defined that, you know, for this thing, you give grain, for this thing, you give, you slaughter a lamb, for this, you know, so it's just different levels of offerings. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, and there were so many, and they were so different, um, which is the intriguing, um, which is the intriguing thing. So, um, and it's actually quite complex, but so sometimes people would, um, but one of the things we start seeing here, isn't it, is this whole concept of the first fruits offering um, are, are, are come up here again. So, and then there's these guilt offerings, if you've done something, or friendship, like Kim said, there are lots of different kinds of offerings, but all of them that are brought to the temple, the, the Levites, and Aaron's family um, get a portion of. So yeah, interesting. Um, what what other uh, things come to mind? Um, in that first verse, it, it's I, I was just curious. I was kind of trying to do two things at once and go out to logos, but it says your sons and your father's family are to bear the iniquity offenses against the sanctuary and my NIV says responsibility but I wanted I wondered if you could talk about that with the priest bearing the iniquity because I there's got to be something to our high priest bearing the iniquity yes so um this is that uh that concept that we're getting in the book of numbers and certainly it's there in Leviticus that that God is holy and, and we are not, so um, there needs to be this barrier. And, and so here the, the Hebrew um, is lift up or raise or take is, and, you know, here translated as bear in the ESV. Um, iniquity is sin. Um, it, it, guilt, um, punishment even. Um, uh, it's actually from the root to twist or be bent. Uh, uh, so, but in this form, it's usually translated as that, that way. So yeah, it's fascinating that we have this concept that there is this need for um, this priestly office. And absolutely, when we get to the New Testament, we, this is where we start trying to make sense of Christ and his death on the cross from the concept of Christ being our great high priest who was both priest and sacrifice. Um, you know, that, that, that wonderful bit of Christian art of the lamb, not slaughtered, but triumphant. Um, you, you know, it has the little, the staff of victory um, and the flag of victory and it's kind of, you know, um, legs or front, front paws and, 
you see the lamb there, and that's kind of the hold up that Jesus is the lamb um, and, and the victorious lamb, the priest for us. So, so a lot of things come together that way. So yeah, Kim, I appreciate you, um, you know, I, drawing our attention to that because here we see the office of the priest. Um, yeah, how did, how, did, how did we do with that? You wanna expand or does that sound good? Our uh, study note in our NIV uh, study Bible says that uh, the, sin, the laments of the people were very real. Uh, grievous sins would be uh, against the holy meeting place, would be judged by death. And then it says the Lord's mercy in providing a legitimate priesthood was actually an aspect of his grace because it was the people's only hope for deliverance from judgment. Yep. That's a, it's <laughs> here's a scary God, <laughs> very scary place, but uh, there's mercy actually involved and grace involved. I would really wouldn't have thought about that so much as much yeah. as all the you know all the have tos, all the behavioral things that we've got to do. Yes, uh, that's a helpful note and a great comment that this is God providing the priesthood and making sure it's provided for is actually for the people <laughs> and, and is, is graceful. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Really helpful there. Pastor Bill, I was just curious, maybe for you personally, when you decided that you were going to go into the ministry, how, how was this idea of provision for you? Because it's not like it's a, you know, money making, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that something that you had to work through or do they help you through that in seminary or how was yeah. that for you? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to have entered the priesthood as such or being a pastor in a time, you know, uh, when I entered the ministry 30 years ago, I have to honestly say I wasn't ever worried about it because pastors were at least were compensated like I think it's traditionally been, they, the church has tried to kind of do what a teacher does. Um, at least that's been the standard. I don't know if it's still, but um, so I, I knew I wasn't going to make a lot of money, um, but um, I can honestly say on one side, I knew that there would be enough that I didn't need to worry about it. But at the same time, if, you know, my, I guess my call was strong enough that, you know, I just didn't, didn't think about, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm making a big sacrifice here. So it never really felt that way to me. I, I do think about though, how, pastors and generations before me were in a different world. Um, you know, uh, I, the stories of the pastors on the frontier who, and even in my prior congregation in Lodi, um, you know, uh, wasn't too many generations back or one generation back really where the pastor was getting paid by people bringing chickens and and, <laughs> you know, some of the produce, that's the way the congregation took care of the pastor. Um, and so, you know, I, I entered the ministry in a time when the church was strong enough to be able to take care of things. But then I also, the other factor, um, full disclosure, I suppose, is that, you know, I knew we kind of had made a decision when Sandy and I got married that we were going to be a dual income. You know, she was a teacher um, for 20 years and then principal and on from there. But um, so, you know, we we were able because of that to, you know, have a certain standard that we certainly would not have been able to have if I was just paid my own pastor salary, which we would have been fine, but it would have looked a lot differently than having her income. So so that but so it, I have to, to answer your specific question. I don't, it, it, you know, it was just kind of a given. I'd have enough, but it never was something I thought, oh man, you know, I'm really making a sacrifice. Because in truth, 
Um, I've been very blessed, at least certainly in my congregations, that you know they've been meeting the clergy guidelines, and and so I've been very blessed that way. So, um, but that's getting harder. That it's it's going back to more of a sacrifice for pastors with the church in its place of decline, uh, or at least in many congregations. Um, you know, the churches are not able to afford to pay a pastor now, most smaller congregations. So the pastors having, to, we're going to see a lot more of, you know, tent maker pastors where they do a job on one side and then they work another job, you know, in the church part time. I think only four congregations in our synod of 80 congregations can afford a pastor over 15 years of experience. So, so it's, it's, it's going to start, you know, being more of a sacrifice. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it did. And I didn't want to put you on the spot, but no. I just wondered if that was something seminaries are helping with, um, you know, and like in the Psalm program that I'm in, there's a lot of people that are actually functioning in that role now that are in this program. They're preaching and, um, you know, they're just doing it for free um, to support their congregations. So. That's right, because a lot of times congregations are, one, either isolated enough that they can't find a pastor or they can't afford one. And so the Synod with this um, Psalm program that Kim's involved in is doing training of lay people to get them to a place where they can um, do this kind of pastoral role, which is really good. It's an important response to the situation. So no, I don't, I don't feel put on the spot at all about that. Actually, this, is a, it's a great question because um, this and then another passage, let me see if I can grab it here in uh, 1 Corinthians. So Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this issue comes up. How do you take care of the pastors or the priests? Um, so we've heard about it in Numbers that it's God's design so the priests can truly take care of those holy things that and be that position that they get provided for. Well, in the New Testament, look what Paul does with this. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is sacrificed on the altar? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So that's, that's kind of a huge text for the concept of having a pastor like me or multiple pastors in our really healthy, wonderful congregation uh, um, that, that do have their living taken care of so they can attend to the gospel full time. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So um, I, on the flip side of that, um, should get their living by the gospel. I don't think he says become rich beyond measure by the gospel. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know, there's, I guess it's a little subjective what the standard is there, but but I see I see that as having a basic standard of the people that you serve, you know, and and I think that's kind of what the church has done. So, but it's interesting that that this passage in Numbers, you know, how do we apply it today? Well, we've got pastors and they are full time, you know, um, and and we work it that way. So, yeah. Perfect. Are there, any, are there any pastors that still live in parsonages? You know, that is um, a rarity now. I'm trying to find Gloria. Where are you? There you are. Um, th they're, uh, they've become less and less and less. And it's actually, I think, going to come back a little bit to bite the church. And even while I say that, um, I'm happy that I've been able to have a home and, and create equity and, you know, over my years. Uh, the reason that they stop, that they become less and less it, um, a part of the church is that um, pastors, it's such a benefit for a pastor to, you know, on the long term, just like for everybody, they want to own a house and develop that equity and appreciation and all of that. So more and more congregations have sold those, but there are still congregations with 
parsonages. And it's a real blessing. The problem right now with a lot of the situation in the church is mobility. You know, you got to sell your house, you've got to do, you know, all these things. But when a pastor just would move to a parsonage, they could come, you know, they take the call, they move in, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, they're, they're much rarer than what they've been in the past. Yeah. One thing it, I know is, is uh, this whole message is given to Aaron, but again, it's going out to all of the people, including the kids. Yeah. And it strikes me that our society now with the millennials, most a lot of the millennials really have no concept of having any kind of responsibility to support a church. Mm. Or, you know, unless they're taught or brought up to um, to be part of that and can see the value of stewardship from their part right from early days. Right. Um, you know, that's a tough one to work with a lot of times with kids. But still... Um, the whole system is set up so the group hears this and the the whole family is is involved well you make a great point um on a number of accounts um one we need to teach stewardship to our children and our high schoolers and young adult kids and and i can confess that uh you know i've fallen short in some respects that way um, you, 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 yeah, your your comment though brings up a number of thoughts. Definitely, it's the older generations that are the financial engine of the congregation. Oftentimes, younger families are you know getting their kids to things and don't have as much. Um, but but I actually you know it doesn't always ring true that way. But yeah, we've I've heard a lot about the millennials and then the next generation that they give differently. That's why we've tried to do the online giving and they, you know, they use their phones and all that. But we're, so we're trying to work with them. But yeah, we've got to teach about this, don't we, Sharon? Um, but it isn't just the younger generation. I'll never forget this story. There, in my last parish, there was a woman who was a friend of somebody that was a member in our church. And we kind of, you know, being out, outreach wise and loving our neighbor um, she was going through cancer and you know myself and the other pastor we went and visited her in the hospital and really gave her good pastoral care and and the church members supported her we just kind of adopted her we helped her um, and it was great she got through she beat her cancer and then at some point i said you know um i wonder if you wouldn't, because she didn't go to any other church, and I, I said I made an invitation, a very gentle, non-pushy, non, you know, <laughs> if we're not going to help you unless you start coming to church, <laughs> nothing like that, you know. Just I gave her an invite, and I'll never forget what she said for me. She said to me, "Oh, Pastor, church really isn't for me." So. And I get it, I, for whatever, I don't know her, and I don't mean to be judgmental, but but note her thought. She was the beneficiary of all this care. Why did she get it? Because people care for the church. If everybody had her attitude about the church, no, she would have gotten zero care. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, so again, I'm not saying that to be judgmental of her necessarily, but this concept, you made me think about that, Sharon, because this concept of taking care of the church, taking care of the priesthood, making sure that institution as such, and a pastor, I'm a part of that institution, and institutions have gotten bad, like a bad connotation, but institution, we wouldn't be able to survive without institutions. So, so you know, taking care of those important entities, whether it be governments, church, you know, citizenship, different organizations, you, talk, you can think about, it's not just the church, Try, talk to the Lions Club or the Rotary Club and all these, and, and they, you know, <laughs> um, it's hard to get uh, the Elks or whatever, you know, they're, most of their members are older, the younger generations are not joining, they're not, 
That's another thing that's sometimes said is they're not join, joiners. That's not important to them. But, but there is this sense that if we don't take care of this, it's not going to be there for us when we need it. And so that's what you made me think of. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So let's, let's finish this chapter. And then I want to talk about whether we can be critical of this chapter a little bit here. Um, <laughs> So let's see, where did we leave off? 21, I think? Yep. That's 21, uh, 21, is that right? Okay. So Levites have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance, so more of this 10% thing to the Levites, that the people of Israel do not come near the tent. Okay, I think we got that. Let's go to 25. Um, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, moreover, now, so now back to Moses, you shall speak and say to the Levites, when you take from the people of Israel the tithe that I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present a contribution from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. So this is cool. The priests and Moses himself, whatever they receive, they need to tithe. As a pastor, I better be, you know, in my opinion, um, a good example of first fruits giving. Um, so, you know, but that's, you know, we're expected to give a part of that too. We don't get to, you know, <laughs> oh, we don't have to give, you know, that, that doesn't work. And your contribution shall be counted to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of your wine press. So you shall present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes which you receive from the people of Israel, and from it you shall give to the Lord's contribution to Aaron the priest. Out of all the gifts to you, you shall present every contribution due to the Lord. From each, its best part is to be dedicated. That's an ongoing stewardship lesson for us that God, we don't want to just give God the leftovers. And that's why we really push in the church today, first fruits giving, whatever it is, we're not going to worry about the tithe, you know, whatever you can do, make a decision, do it. And, and, you know, um, that's just a great stewardship lesson there. When you offered it from the best of it, then the rest shall be counted to the Levites as produce of the fleshing, threshing floor and produce of the wine press. And you may eat it in any place and your households, for it is your reward in return for your service in the tent of meeting. And you shall bear no sin by reason of it when you have contributed the best of it, but you shall not profane the holy things in the people of Israel, lest you die. This is a really interesting, important sentence. Because here's my problem. Not a problem, but here's... Here, well, I'll just put this, uh, let me see if I can put this uh, question. Um, I know you can't see it all, but basically the discussion question is, what are the dangers of the um, pro-priestly accounts in Numbers 16 through 18? Because remember what we've been hearing now, we've been hearing how important the priests are, we need this barrier, we need this office, what are the dangers of all this? Um, you know, can we think critically of this is just a question I have. Nobody wants to tackle that one. <laughs> Oops, oh, I went, sorry, there we go. Um, yeah, what are the dangers of it? Or are there dangers or, you know? Well, they've already seen what happened to Cora. Right there, so there was some priests that did bad stuff, and they got in trouble. Jerry, uh, it it can give them more power, and the power can go to their heads, and uh, mm -hmm. they can use that for their own good instead of the good of the people. Wow. Okay, we can move on now. <laughs> I I mean, just so succinctly put it, um, it's power, and what do we know about power? Yeah, it can absolutely so absolutely that's right that's right so here we are back on the same uh on the same um 
on the same situation that we were in before a few weeks ago or even last week where we were talking about the office of priests and the danger of power and position and and whatnot um yeah so does this just give blanket power to the priests here or? <laughs> I think it's interesting that all those gifts all just speak about food. They're not talking about clothing or housing or any other things that we think are important. Yeah, probably culturally, Bruce, this is that food, that was money, and that was, you know, and as far as clothing, they had such little that may not even have come in as a factor. So, yeah, it's really all about food, isn't it? <laughs> that that was the the thing yeah well they weren't going to get the land they weren't going to inherit any land so this is their inheritance yes that's true that's right that's right but they but they better not defile it or they'll die yeah there you go gloria there's the warning so there is a check on the priestly power yeah yeah. yeah, but by Jesus' time, you see how corrupt by power they had become, and they use a lot of those rules to their own advantage and to condemn Jesus then, and they don't really seem to have room for love and compassion and, you mm -hmm. know, like all those kinds of things anymore. Yeah. Kind wow. of for them. Yep. Yep. Boy, you can, you can just see this tension. God puts authority and power in these offices. They're needed, but human beings mess them up. Seems like. So what's the, is the answer to get rid of the positions? <laughs> that's, no, I know you're not saying that, Kathy, but that's a question. <laughs> that's a question a lot of people have. Um, part of the Protestant Reformation, not Lutheran Reformation, this is really important distinction, but a lot of the Protestant Reformation, those who were more radical than Luther, threw out all of the system of authority of the church. Mm -hmm. right? And now you just have, you know, individual congregations, you have, um, from some of the reformers viewpoint, you have anarchy, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, they saw the abuse of power so much that then they kind of stripped and we're not even going to have pastors or we're not going to have priests in that yeah. office. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you, the one answer is just to try and not have those, that institution or, and I see this a lot in some, what do we hear people say today? Oh, I'm religious, but I'm not, I'm, no, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I'm not into the institutional church. No. Mm -hmm. One of the most prevalent reasons people don't go to church is I don't believe in the institutional church. Well, one reason they don't is because human beings are corrupt and they see institutions you know, do bad things. But my question is, is, well, I guess you don't need to be a citizen in the country because look at our government, you know. <laughs> well, I guess we don't, we, won't, we don't have any government because, you know, leaders are fallible, you know. Um, you know, so if you carry it through, you pretty much run into anarchy. Um, so I don't, you know, it, we can go too far one way. That, too. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, anyway, yeah, well, let's keep going at this. I, I didn't mean to talk over anybody else. Other, other thoughts on this, this one, place? One thing that really stands out to me is God is a God of order. I mean, he's so orderly mm. in all of his, uh, in everything he does and says. Interesting. Yeah. You may, you remind me of where the apostle Paul says, let's have all things done in order. <laughs> That's our Lutheran, you know, proof text right there. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah, and in that case, it, people, Paul said that about worship because people were speaking in tongues and it was chaos. But, but you're right. God does seem to set up these offices and an institution and a certain sense of order. And even in creation, we can see an order, can't we? You know, yeah. Yeah, good. And God doesn't say you should do your best to do these things. He, 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 the, he, the penalty is not you're going to spend 10 days in jail uh, or pay a fine. The penalty is death. Yeah. Well, at least... <laughs> Pretty drastic. Yeah. At least when it comes to certain things, the penalty is death. Sometimes you mess up, you can have it resolved with this and that and whatnot. But this is a pretty... Um, this is a pretty, I appreciate you saying that, Bert, because it kind of almost like, I think what you're saying, it shows this is important to God. This is not just an option. <laughs> this is, this is, in your case. yeah, yeah. What, what is really profane? What, what are you doing with? Desecrate, I'd say. Yeah, let's, well, let's, let's dig down a little bit and take a look at that. Um, so we'll just go over here to uh, treat with contempt, um, make something impure, um, defile is, um, uh, is the sense of it. So um, I think this, yeah, that's a great thing to focus in on. As a priest, pastor, um, I am to treat the things that have been put in my charge with great respect and sacredness and reverence. So I think of profane something almost as to treat something irreverently. So, you know, I take my call with great fear and trembling and that it's a holy thing just like as all of us being priesthood of all believers as first peter says uh, in the new testament that we should all take our call as something very holy very sacred and so to profane something is to make it um unholy like treat it with contempt uh you know it'd be kind of like if, how would i profane like if i if I went to church and I uh, went out to Kentucky Fried Chicken and said, I think I'm hungry. I think I'll go eat it on the altar. <laughs> that would be kind of to me like, wait a minute, that's a sacred place. You know, I've got a dinner table for Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know? Does that, I don't know, Bruce, does that help at all? Well, would it be somewhat like uh, in Luther's time where uh, the priests were selling indulgences? Oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. But absolutely, that was the problem. That, yeah. And in fact, even more so, more so, they're using it for selfish gain. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful. If you use this for selfish gain, it's not, it's not going to go well for you. You know, this, this, the thing that with fear and trembling, this se sentence reminds me of, is when Jesus says, if you cause any of these little ones to stumble, it'll be better for you to have a millstone wrapped around your neck and thrown. You know, I mean, that's, that's serious words. We don't want to cause someone else to stumble. We don't want to profane the holy things. And that's exactly what Luther felt was going on, is that the church was taking, used, exploiting God's forgiveness and grace that, and ruining the gospel, which is the ultimate profaning of holy things. So, oh, that's great, Bruce. That, that's really, that's really helpful connection. Yeah. Well, I kind of think in terms of death, uh, death and life contrast each other big time. And it comes across like God gives us life and our death worries us to, worries us to death. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, so he provides a, a way through death. 
But mm -hmm. these are, I mean, to me, the fact that God stresses the penalty of death as a penalty, but he also has going, he shows you how you don't die, how you preserve life. So life and death are equally um, very, most of utmost importance to God. Absolutely. And then you just give me opportunity to say that what's one of the main significances of, of the death and life, resurrection of Christ is that life, <laughs> that death has been dealt the oh, defeating God. blow of Christ, and then we receive that victory. So, you know, yeah, and, you know, we don't die now. <laughs> At least uh, we don't suffer this punishment um, in the grace of Christ. Yeah, I think somebody else was jumping in. Gloria, were you jumping in there? Yeah. I, I was I was just, I remember when I was a kid, we did not go to the altar at all. I mean, only the parents uh -huh. went up for communion and so forth. And I can remember in our last church, even I was a wedding, wedding coordinator, and it was really difficult for me at first to go up and get things ready up, like I had to change the banners and different things around the altar. It was, it was really, difficult for me at first to do that I got used to it but even now <coughs> doing communion here at home I'm finding it a little less holy than it is at church yes oh. yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that comment I see a lot of people shaking their heads anybody yeah. want to jump on expand be a little less holy but it's still very beneficial for our uh, feeding of our soul you know it's something we need so it's i'm glad we're doing it that way yeah yeah cindy um yeah i am um, <coughs> i live in a household where no one can give me communion mm. and the the thing that has stopped me from giving myself communion is that I haven't come up with what I need. And so I'm fasting basically mm -hmm. until it, it, and it's okay. I've prayed a lot about that, but when you live alone or with people that are not going to participate, you have to learn how to feed yourself with Christ in different ways. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I've, I've mm -hmm. found some, I, you know, I think the spirit has given me a peace that it's, it's okay. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that comment. I love Bob's comment. I love what Gloria said. Let's keep going with this a little bit. Anybody else want to jump here on in on this? Some of you folks that are down below, I'm, I got to come down here and see if you raising your hand or anything. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, I'm, I'll just pause just to give everybody a chance here if you if you want. Okay, anybody trying to get in? Because I have some great things I want to say Kathy about this. Kathy is. <laughs> oh, Kathy is. Okay, please, Kathy. I think she's muted. Kathy, you're muted. Oh, he, he, no. Kathy, which Kathy? Kathy Havers. Oh, Kathy. Here, let me, oh. I'll, there you go. Unmute. There you go. You're good, Kathy. Okay. No, I just wanted to say the one thing that um, has struck me as we've been doing the communion at home, I think very much of the early church where their communions were held at home. Mm -hmm you know, in their homes and given to each other. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a good, you know, a good. Yeah. Result. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. So to think of that. Excellent, Kathy. Yeah, no, the, um, that's right. And the early church started out worshiping in people's homes. Um, and they would, but th there would be a gathering in that home, of course, but yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Keep, that's great comment. Um, uh, others, anybody else trying to get in here? Uh, please, Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Okay. Um, it kind of makes me think about sometimes it seems like there are a lot of like human rules around communion. I mean, there's different traditions. Like when I grew up, you had to go to private confession with the priest before you could have communion. Therefore, a lot of people didn't receive communion regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, then I think about like going to someone's funeral, even someone in your family, maybe they're, they go to the Catholic church or the Orthodox church, like where I grew up, and you're not allowed to receive communion because you're not of the same, uh, I guess, yes. same faith, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I don't know, it's an interesting thing because it seems like maybe people have built a lot of things around it that I'm not sure Jesus meant for it to be like that. Yes, interesting. Here, I'm going to. I'm going to just move all of you guys over so I can see everybody now because we're just finish up with this great discussion. Well, that was one of the um, one of the big things that Luther did, and it's in the Augsburg Confession that the the um, like preparation over the the holiness of the person who's serving communion isn't of issue. You know, like there, there was a question like with baptism, if the priest was a heretic, if the baptism was going to be valid or not. And mm -hmm. if the priest didn't practice communion rightly, was it invalid? And what, what the confession says is that it's the word that makes it valid. It's, mm -hmm. And so this, the speaker of the word, you know, they never are holy enough to preside rightly. It's really yeah. God that does the work. And so to me with home communion, that's what, you know, I, I read a lot about it, whether I should do it or not, or whether it was right for my family. And I, I just felt like because it's the word that does the work that um, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly... Um... That's exactly where it comes down to, is what makes it, is it the pastor, it's the word, and the, the office, the office of pastor is put there to make sure the word is rightly, you know, put with the sacrament. Um, so there is a role for the priest. Yeah, Melanie, jump in there. Um, and I think that Jesus knows what's going on in this world, and that he's happy that we are doing communion at home, because you have given us the words to say as we give to each other. Yeah, we are more than there's my husband and myself and we're with the church. So there's more than two and three. And so God is there among us. Yeah. How I feel. yeah. 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 You make a great point. Um, you make a great point. I love that we've gone to this discussion because when we talk about holy things and glory, um, you know, Gloria, you got us started with, you know, it doesn't quite feel as holy at home as it does in the church. And the positive about that is that we invest in our holy spaces, therefore a sacred purpose. And, and so I'm glad to hear, you know, <laughs> and yes, going back, I remember growing up my home, Missouri Synod Church, man, when I walked up to the altar area, I was, it was like fear and trembling, you know. This is a, and there's something positive about having a sacred space. Now, in all actuality, there's nothing more sacred about that space than my dinner, dinner table at home. God is everywhere, you know, but we as human beings, we invest in things. So, so that's a, the positive side. The, the negative, just like the, with the priesthood, it has its positive and its negative. The negative side of that is that maybe we've said, well, that's the holy space and not our dinner table. <laughs> or our home. Like Kathy, you mentioned, you know, Christians began worshiping in their homes. And so the home is a sacred space. So, so maybe this, you know, isolation has helped us reclaim our homes, hopefully, as sacred places too. It's not an either or, it's a both, both and. Yeah, Kathy. And, and also Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
he didn't say make sure that you're comfortable in you know or in a certain space or whatever um it's when two or three are gathered and and do this in remembrance of me and so i think that's the focus not where we are or what we're doing although we we have to you know confess our sins and and you know do as much as we can to prepare ourselves right. because jesus is there yeah so, yeah yeah good why we're doing it <laughs> yeah yeah no good sure. yeah um last yeah, supper was really a supper you know like she said a home setting it wasn't a church setting at all <laughs> okay well let me uh let me just for fun play devil's advocate well why what do we need the church for anyway then uh, well <laughs> <laughs> well i think like you said it's for order and I'm, I started did that. Um, I started a study on Acts, and um, it's interesting that the um, the pastor that's doing it talked a lot about the upper room, and that's where they met right after. Um, you know, that's where they met in the first chapter of Acts is in the upper room, and he was talking about all the other things that had happened in that room, including the supper, and that um, it's really the place that they went back to, and. Um, you know, it's kind of was the first church. That's where they um, elected the new apostle. And um, so it yeah. kind of was a church. The church was born there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah please, um, Kathy. I think it's really important also because we encourage each other. And, and there is a verse, and I'm sorry, I don't know where it is, to say, you know, forsake not the, the gathering together because God knows that we need to encourage each other, especially in hard times. So, yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, Stephanie, you were going to chime in too. Yeah. Kind of the same idea. Community is so important and makes us stronger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Oh, this is, this is great. So this is church right here. This yes. is church. Yeah. 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 And who would have thought we'd have got here to have this lovely conversation listening to the regulations of the priests in Numbers 18. <laughs> but it's a perfect, it is a perfect connection and bridge to today. It absolutely is. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to it's good to invest in places, in a table, in a church, in a building even, um, as a holy place so that when we go there, when we need to feel God's presence, we can do that. But right now we can't do that for various health reasons. So we're not limited to that space, you know, and we can now affirm that wherever the word is present and wherever two or more gathered, Jesus is there. So it's a both and, in my opinion. Um, and I can say that um, the, the you know, each side could have its downsides. You know, I, I think, you know, there are Christians who don't go belong to a wider church community. They have their little home church. They don't need the institution church. But then there are other folks that just look at the church like the God box, like that's where God stuff happens in my home. They, and kids grow up with no sense that what happens in that sanctuary has anything to do with their homework <laughs> or their playground. You know, So we, we want to hold up a both and on this. Um, God does put these institutions because he knows we need it. And that's when I, as Lutheran Christians, I suppose this would be true for all sacramental churches. We believe in sacraments, one, because they're in scripture and it's what Jesus commanded us to do. But we would also say we're tactile people and we need sacraments. Mm -hmm. um, I need baptism. I need to be able to cling to something that was done and given to me. Um, I need the Lord's Supper because sometimes just hearing it, just, you know, it's not the same. Um, 
you know, when it comes to the question of doing home communion like we're doing it now or virtual communion, um, the, I think Kim named the most, you know, it's really putting the, we've always said it's not, it's putting the word of Christ together with the bread and wine that make the sacrament. And so that seems to me can happen virtually. But at the same time, I think that the separating of the, that word from the table in the sanctuary and from the gathered community, um, there's something missing there. To me, it doesn't feel like exactly the same. But again, like all of you have said, these are crazy, amazing times. And the Lord, like Melanie, you said, you know, sometimes we have to, I look at it this way. I have my theological mind and I have my pastoral mind. And sometimes we have to go to the pastoral side. Um, but I totally respect, and here's the, Cindy, you know, when you do have, when we do start having communion services, which won't be too much longer. And in fact, I think we're going to include communion in the parking lot service. Um, we're going to, you know, have little sealed things of wine or grape juice and, and bread and bless them at a table in the parking, you know, by the outside the gathering place. And with people with masks and gloves, we'll distribute them to the cars. Um, I think we're going to do it that way. So, you know, that's going to be a powerful experience. And for all of us, whether we've been having home communion or not, when we get back together and we have the Lord's Supper in the sanctuary again, I think that's still going to be a powerful, a powerful thing. So, so yeah, it's the one thing I will say as I'm thinking out loud about this, um, I've noticed that most of the churches that are sacramental in nature, Actually, does anybody know what the Episcopal Church has ruled on this? Have they officially? Yeah, there, it's like ours, where the bishops have said it's probably better not to, but if you feel, you know, called to do it, then do it. So they've they've left it open. Yeah. Yeah, that North American Lutheran Church, the bishop has, after giving people just freedom, has come back and asked congregations not to do it. And I think Missouri has said not to do it. Um, you know, the Catholic Church is in a whole different thing that way. They do it, and the priest just takes communion. So they still do it, but they don't have people do it in their homes, of course. So, yeah, it's interesting. And so the churches that are more, well, this is just a representation, um, are more, there's less hurdles to, to, to do this. But, um, yeah, it's just been an interesting thing, which I hope we'll never have to face again. <laughs> well, you know, one, one thing that um, I think is important, I mean, for older people like us, it's, you know, whether or not you should do it or not, you know, we can work that out. But I think it's, it's been important for people that have children to see how important it is to take church home and to continue to go to church, even if you can't, even if the yeah. doors to the sanctuary are closed. Um, yeah. Because like with my family growing up, we never did anything outside of the walls of the church. And um, so I hope that's one consequence of this is that it's kind of driven church out into the homes and that kids can really appreciate what that means. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to put had, that. Uh, had a little different vision of the, uh, the parking lot. Um, get, uh, parking lot church? Communion. Yeah. I just thought our ending would be very meaningful to have the is with the drive through that is a possible there to drive through receive the communion and quietly drive off that would uh -huh. be the end, ultimate end of the service yeah rather than trying to do it in mass in the parking lot with everybody kind of separate yeah. the well, one, one with with you or whatever person's there yeah serving it to the cars they go by someplace separated enough that it's safe <laughs> yeah well that i'll we'll definitely take that suggestion in mind because we're making we're figuring this out right now so uh, <laughs> so no i i appreciate that bruce and and we might we might that we'll, we're going to be talking about how we do the distribution so i will put that suggestion in the mix for sure so all right i know we're a little bit over time um, I love that we've 
had this conversation today about the, the office of priest and the office of the church. And um, remember, you are all priests um, in, part, in the priesthood of all believers. Um, and even though it's important to have pastors and priests, um, it's actually bottom line, it's for the people. And it's a gift to the people. Um, it's a gift to the gospel. And so that's certainly what we want to keep going. So, all right. Well, let me uh, close this in a prayer here. And then uh, I'll stick around in the meeting if anybody wants to ask any other questions or make any comments. Um, but you guys just make my day every Thursday. I can't wait to see you. So thank you. All right. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this time in your word. Uh, it is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It is um, the very uh, energy of our faith. And so we thank you that we can be in your word and read that together. And I thank you where this conversation has gone today. And I pray it's helpful to us and a blessing to your church. We continue to hold before you family and friends that are suffering in this time economically or with their health whether they're ill or what they're grieving. We hold before you all our families and friends that we know of hurting in this time and each household here that might be hurting in that way. Um, we give thanks for your church. We give thanks that you are working to bring something good and many good things out of this crisis um, and bring life out of death. And so we pray that that'll continue and that um, You'll guide our church in the weeks and months ahead as we continue to negotiate this these waters. And so um, be with us, Lord Jesus, until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed week, everyone.